What's up, y'all? I'm not gonna introduce myself as every other YouTuber does because I know you know how to read. Hopefully. Me fail English? That's impossible. So today we're talking about 20 great movements that I don't do. The first one is one arm rows. Or one arm rows. So on paper, these are absolutely fantastic and probably better than barbell rows. You don't have to have as much lower back involvement because it's only on one side. Um, there's an anti-rotation component, which is nice for the obliques. You can get better range of motion at the bottom, better range of motion at the top. You can really, you know, get a nice flex as well. You can rotate so it's easier on the wrists, the elbows, maybe even a little bit easier on the shoulders as well. You can hit the rear delts by flaring out more. You can hit the traps by squeezing back. You can hit the lats by rowing closer to the hip. You can really arc that dumbbell all the way back. Again, on paper, these are all amazing things. Just for me personally... I don't really feel them working very well. And I don't think it's because I'm doing them wrong. It's just something that I don't find working for me, even after trying them many times. And yet I included these in my book, as with every other movement on this list. And I include them in training plans all the time as well. So it's not just about me. I realize that I have some bias and just because something doesn't work for me doesn't mean that it won't work for other people. Number two, the conventional deadlift. Now these are often known as the king of exercises, but I personally either prefer to pull sumo if it's from the ground, I prefer to do a rack pull, but it's not like I lack mobility because I also do a lot of deficit work as well. For some reason, that height just doesn't seem to be a great fit for me. I can pull just as much from a deficit as from a normal height. And again, it's a fantastic movement should be included in a lot of people's programs, and I often do. It's just not right for me. Number three, the chin-up. So with an underhand grip, you get more biceps engagement. Will you marry me? Are you walking me? Activation, and you can also often move more weight or get more reps. But for me, I just find this position is really awkward. Here is okay, but when I go up, my arm just wants to rotate out. And so neutral grip work works really, really well. And then overhand also agrees with my body. Some people, they can get in a dead hang position and have this underhand grip and be completely fine. I'm just not one of those people. Before Olympic weightlifting. Now this can be decent for hypertrophy. I think it's great for explosiveness, but it's extremely technical and I just don't want to take the time and the effort to invest in this type of movement. It requires a ton of upkeep. I did a full video on technical rating of various lifts. You can find that up above in a card. But basically, it's a massive time investment, and I'm not willing to invest that time. Plus, I do have an old wrist injury, and so I can do front squats, but like cleaning a weight and trying to catch it in this position, it's sort of a no-fly zone for me. Also, I have muscle imbalances in my shoulders that I've always had, even from when I started lifting, and therefore like catching a snatch overhead, you can maybe even, even see it, is really just not something that makes sense for me. Again, not bad at all, just bad for me. Number five, goblet squats. Now this is one of my preferred ways to teach a beginner how to squat. It keeps them very upright, it forces them to brace, um, and it's just a great overall movement for beginners. However, at a certain point, getting that dumbbell into position is a huge pain in the ass. Plus, in my gym, they only have up to 40 kilo dumbbells. A lot of gyms in China, I live in China, by the way, they only have dumbbells up to like 25 kilos. I've been to gyms, they have tons of machines, tons of equipment, clearly invested a lot in the gym. The heaviest dumbbells were like 25 kilos. Not even kidding. And so for a goblet squat, if you're in that situation, it sort of has an expiration date. Number six, the low bar back squat. Now, the first time I low bar back squatted, it was like probably six years ago, I took my high bar five rep max and I did it for 20 reps. It was a little bit rest pausey, but still 20 reps with my five rep max. So I am legitimately a lot stronger in the low bar position. However, I still don't do it for a few reasons. First, it doesn't really feel as comfortable with the bar back in that low bar position, hanging off the rear delt. And two, I don't really care about my absolute powerlifting strength very much. Even if I would probably be 15, maybe even 20% stronger. For me, 
what's the point? Like, I'm never ever going to be a competitive powerlifter, and therefore I would rather do the movements that are going to get me more hypertrophy. Because for me, just squatting more weight in an easier style doesn't really bring any benefit. So yes, I care about strength, but only on the movements that I care about. So I'm not going to do like a massively arched bench press or, you know, the sumo deadlift where you squeeze your feet under the plates and you're like, wow, boom, three inches range of motion. That's not going to satisfy anyone. Number seven, cable rows. And this one's pretty simple. It's because the gym doesn't have a cable row machine. If it did, I would be doing it probably every single week, but it doesn't. So I don't. It does have a sort of dual cable setup. And there's this one other guy, this trainer at the gym, is 25 kilos per side of the stack, which isn't very much. And so he literally lugs over six dumbbells, 12, 12, 10, 10, 8, 8, stacks them up on the machine like four or five feet high. And then he does rows that way. It looks like the machine is going to break every single time he does it. And so I guess technically I could do cable rows that way but it's just not really worth it because I would probably not snap my own shit up, but snap the machine up. Number eight, pendlay row. So this is where you are in a sort of very perpendicular, no, parallel position with the ground, with your torso, and you are rowing in a very strict way. So this does take some tension off of the lower back because you are resetting every single rep. So you're not really controlling the eccentric to the extent that you would with something like a cone row where it is floating the entire time. For me, I've never really seen the point of this. I guess it's for upper back because you are more bent over and you're pulling toward the chest, but I don't really feel like it does all that much or provides all that much value. I do occasionally write them in programs, but not as much as a normal barbell row. Number nine, Meadows rows. Now again, these are all from my book. It's just going in order of things that are in my book, but I don't do very often. The Meadows rows, you can either do these in one of two ways. I forget which one is what John Meadows originally intended. You can either set up perpendicular to the barbell or parallel alongside it. Either way, it's a one arm row. So you're grabbing the end of the barbell and you're just rowing that side of the barbell. This is sort of unique because it gives a sort of arc to the movement. So it's not like a dumbbell row. It's not like a barbell row. It's sort of a weird mix. Personally, I never felt like this was doing that much. I never really felt all that stable in that position. And there are so many other better rowing movements for me that I don't find like it really gives me very much value. But for you, that might be different. Number 10, the decline bench press. Now, the biggest reason is because my gym doesn't have a decline bench press machine, but also I don't really feel unracking and re-racking is all that safe just because in a bench press, you know, you can just put it back in a decline press. You have to take it so far out that uh, it really feels like you're just like putting it back over your face. And if you miss, you're fucked. Now, sometimes I do do these, do do, uh, I do <laughs> execute these with dumbbells, but even then I don't feel like the range of motion is doing that much. It does align with the fibers of most of the pectoral muscles very, very well. And it does have some very favorable EMG activity, activation, whatever that is worth, not very much. Um, so it does work well for some people. Some people prefer to do it in a Smith machine just because it's a little bit more stable and the re-racking thing is less of a concern. So try it out, start light, see if it gives you, you know, a good, a good pec pump squeeze, etc. cetera. Um, but for me, not the best movement. Number 11, the one arm pull down. Now, the main reason I don't do these, I, you know, there is a strong, a strong argument for it. You can get a better stretch at the top, better contraction at the bottom. Um, you can rotate again, like a one arm row much easier compared to uh, a straight bar attachment or neutral attachment or whatever. Um, but for me, it takes twice as long. That's, that's the main reason really why I don't do it. Uh, I like to keep a pretty quick tempo through my workouts and, um, you know, the idea of spending twice as much time on that back workout isn't really that appealing. Number 12, the Bradford Press. Now these are a nice lighter weight option. Basically you are pressing in front, above, lowering it behind, going back in front like this. And so it's a very sort of slow and steady tempo with constant 
tension. Okay, enough biceps flexing for you, dude. Um, this can be good, but I find that Arnold presses and Klokov presses just feel better. And um, I don't have that many pressing movements in my rotation. So, you know, I find that I only need three or four good ones. And this is sort of number six or seven or eight on my list. Number 13 is a two-parter. This is the pec deck machine and also the reverse pec deck machine. I find that dumbbells are better in basically every, every way. You have to like adjust the seat and the positioning and your torso angle. And even then you're sort of locked into this one-way street because it's a machine. I find for rear delts, skiers, multiple forms of rear delt raises, occasionally cables are going to be more than enough to get the job done. Plus just all the rowing and pulling move, rowing and pulling movements that you're doing. Sorry, my camera filled up. That's how much content I've been filming. Number 14, front raises. Now, very few people actually need any isolation work for this front delt. Honestly, most of the time, just your normal pushing and pressing is going to be completely adequate. And most people have lagging rear delts and side delts compared to front delts. Now, this is fine if you need some extra front delt work, but that's so few people. Plus, honestly, just doing more pressing is going to be better. According to EMG data, again, for what that's worth, plus just anecdotally, you don't see many naturals doing front delt work. It's mostly enhanced guys because, you know, let's face it, it does look pretty cool. I found that doing it, especially two hands at once, is more of a core exercise than a front delt movement. Plus, it's mostly upper back as well because it has to stabilize your scapula. And so either way, your front delt is probably getting not worked very much. Number 15, upright rows. Now, there are three types of people in the world. Those who love upright rows, those who don't love upright rows, and those who think that no one should ever do upright rows ever even the people who love upright rows. If you go to an Athlete X convention, I assume they have conventions. I mean, it's a cult, so every cult has a convention, right? It's like their church. If you go to an Athlete X convention, you're not like, yeah, I've been doing, uh, been doing a lot of upright rows, really getting, you know, swole side delts. They'll be like, what did you, did you commit sacrilege against Daddy Jeff? Burn him! A sinner comes before you. Shame. 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 Now, my opinion is that if you like upright rows and they feel comfortable, they're probably fine. For most people, if you're like this, ee, probably not. But if you take a wider grip and you focus on the side delt, they're probably okay, especially if they feel okay. This is one circumstance where your individual shoulder anatomy is going to be very important. And again, if they don't feel good, they're probably not good. If they feel good, they're probably good. Number 16, strict curls. Now, I did a full video on these. I just find that if your back is pinned against a wall or a pole or whatever, it really does limit how natural the, the movement feels, okay? Because you have this big weight out in front, Nice. But you can't compensate by leaning back at least slightly. And especially if you're using big weights, you know, you're curling over half of your body weight, it's understandable that your torso will move somewhat. There's going to be a natural compensation for that weight out in front of you. And you not allowing yourself to do that, first, it's going to limit the amount of weight that you can use. Second, it's probably just going to feel weird. Number 17, one arm cable curls. Now, these are also known as Bayesian curls. Uh, Menno Henselman's is a big fan of these. And for good reason. They make a lot of sense. You get that constant tension stretch at the end. Pretty good contraction as well when you're sort of like flexing up at the top. And they're good. They make sense. The reason why I don't do them is that it takes twice as long and I am a lazy sack of shit. So I would rather just do, you know, a normal cable curl in front or just some other biceps movement where I can do both arms at the same time. But if you have time and you have, you know, the energy and the effort and you want to do them and you don't mind taking more time, nothing wrong with them at all. I would say they're actually a really, really good movement, just biomechanically speaking. Ooh, big words. Number 18, the Hercules curl. So this is when you are in the cable machine and you are basically curling like this. And yes, it looks epic. And yes, you might see this on Instagram because it looks 
epic, and that's what Instagram is all about. It's not about functionality, it's just about what looks cool. <laughs> Hashtag battle ropes. Uh, but for me, I can't really justify taking up both sides of the cable machine. Like, you could be taking one with a normal cable curl that is an awesome movement, and yet you've chosen to, like, look cool and to use both sides. So for me, uh, it's sort of a pass. But if you like them, if you enjoy them, if you don't mind being an asshole, completely fine. Number 19, seated calf raises. Now this one's pretty simple. My gym doesn't have this machine. If it did, I would definitely be using it, especially as I have a goal of getting to 17 inch calves during this lean massing phase. So what I've been trying to do is putting dumbbells on my knees and flexing up that way. It doesn't work very well, kind of hurts my knees. It leaves an imprint of the kilo stamp on the dumbbell on my leg after the set is done. And it does, just doesn't really seem very efficient. But if you have access to it and you enjoy it and you feel it and it works well for you, definitely a winner to keep in your program. Number 20, last but not least, weighted crunches. You see these people on the incline bench and you know they have a plate behind their head or a plate on their chest or, or just in the prisoner position or whatever. And they're doing these, these crunches. I find this is mostly hip flexor, which is already an overpoweringly strong muscle group for me anyway. Plus, they tend to tighten up when I do these, which makes squatting and deadlifting a pain in the ass as well as running. Even just walking feels weird after doing these. Uh, and there's no real reason to do these. Um, it's not a great ab exercise. Again, it's mostly hip flexor. And I think there are better and more efficient ways to work the abs. But... If you want to do them, they can work for some people. And so again, as with anything on this list, try them out, see if they work, see if they're comfortable, see if they are a good movement for you. Everything on this list can work for some people. That's why I included them in my book. Even if they're not for me, I have the, uh, <laughs> the good sense to realize that they might be right for you. Therefore, I included them in the book, which... Coincidentally, you can get on my website. It's only $15, 200 pages of pure awesomeness. All right, that's all for this video. Make sure to like the video. I literally just went in and did 20 exercises that I fucking hate for this video. So uh, like the video, it does help a lot. It helps to push it out to more unsuspecting people on the internet. Thank you so much for the support and I will see all y'all in the next video. Peace.